A very good afternoon to all our viewers on day two of Pune International Center's Asia Economic Dialogue 2022, hosted in collaboration with the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. I'm Shilpa Fadke, the event anchor, and I'll be taking you through the day's proceedings. We begin today's session with a panel discussion on the emerging digital world. The session chair is Dr. Ravi Pandit, co-founder and chairman KPIT Technologies and trustee PIC. Mr. David Mansfield, CFO, Vinfast, Vietnam, Mr. Josh Folger, Managing Director, Bharat FIH Limited, Foxconn Technology Group Company, Mr. Samir Nair, CEO, Applause Entertainment Limited, and Mr. Vijay Karnani, former India head, Goldman Sachs, will be the speakers at this session. Welcome all, and I would like to ask Dr. Pandit to kindly begin. Thank you, uh, thank you, Shilpa, for this uh, introduction. And uh, welcome uh, my fellow panelists uh, to this session. Um, you know, the, the theme of uh, this conference is uh, resilient economic growth. And you know, the words are very important. It talks about resilient and it talks about economic growth. So how do we actually marry the two in the context of uh, the world that we see around today is the topic of this uh, panel discussion. And I'm extremely thankful for the panelists to be here uh, with us because they really represent multiple facets of um, different industries uh, from across Asia. And uh, they bring a lot uh, uh, rich expertise in the things that we are going to talk about. The session in my opinion is particularly very relevant uh, from, the from the point of view of resilient economic growth because we are going to talk about the emerging digital world. And I think we have to look at it in the context of uh, where we are and where does that, where can the digital world take us? So what I'm going to do is uh, kind of lay out a broad um, uh, spectrum of the kind of discussion that we're going to have. And then after my initial remarks, uh, I'll do a bit longer introduction of the panelists. And then uh, I'm going to ask them questions. Uh, and all of you are welcome to ask your questions. You can write them in the chat box and uh, we'll be able to address them. So um, with that, uh, we begin. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, uh, resilient economic growth is the topic that we are talking about. And I believe that we are living in truly extraordinary times. And if you are to look at uh, at least three facets of our work, uh, one is uh, how is the world doing economically, especially various sections of the world community, how are they doing economically? And we see that at one end of the spectrum that we are about 700 million people who live below the poverty line. And at the same time, there is a huge liquidity slushing around in the capital markets. So there are some who are doing exceedingly well and there are many who are not doing all that well. Then of course, we have this whole question about uh, climate, climate problem. You know, it's caused by the excessive depletion of energy and material resources of the world. You know, the last uh, 200 years post the industrial revolution has made a phenomenal mark on the world. And that is you know, kind of knocking on our doors. And we are like about one and a half degrees you know, uh, Celsius away from a tipping point as, uh, you know, as is recognized you know, by all. And of course, these problems have been compounded by the recent visit of the pandemic. Uh, to all of us across the globe. So what we see around us is a world that we have built post the industrial area. And we are actually guzzling dirty, exhaustible energy sources. We are precipitating enormous environmental crisis and driving an economic engine that essentially destroys equity. So that is really the picture of the world. And um, I think one would be right in thinking whether we are on the brink of a precipice, but are we really? So, you know, I you know we believe that uh, every challenge spawns a host of new opportunities and it could be a time to remake the world the way in which we want it to be. And we believe that we are on the cusp of a new revolution, the digital revolution, uh, which can possibly, possibly open the world to a cleaner, better, gentler new era in the life of humanity. That is a possibility. 
So, you know, so here are some of the uh, facets of that new digital world. So, you know, we believe that we are stepping into a world where we could live with far less use of resources as energy. So think about e-commerce without shops. So commerce without shops. You don't have to do construction of all those shops, put in all that cement, use all that steel. Hotel chains without rooms. You know, you can use your home rooms for something like this. And we have seen what is happening, say, with uh, Amazon in the first case, with, uh, you know, Airbnb in the second case or Ola in the second case. Movies without theaters. Every drawing room can be a theater. There can be a mobility without personal vehicles. If you look at globally, uh, the usage of personal cars is going down. And every Ola or Uber that you use actually cuts down the number of cars sold for personal use. And if you were to look, look even at one equipment, the mobile phone, think of the things that we have displaced. We don't need a watch. We don't need a compass. We don't need a calculator. We don't need a dictaphone. We don't need a dictionary. A whole bunch of things can go out of the window if you have one intelligent device, which is your mobile phone. So are we then stepping into a world which can use less resources and less energy? Are we also likely to save many of us from boring, repetitive work? So now we are going to talk about factories without workers and we have some people who really represent cutting edge of manufacturing or farms without labor. Why should a human being have to do the hard work in a farm when a machine can do it? Cabs without drivers, planes without pilots, ships without crew. Actually, ships without crew are being just now tested, uh, you know, in the Norwegian waters. It can also make life easier for all of us. You know, meeting people throughout the world without stepping out of our homes. So we have all the panelists who are in their respective offices across the uh, world, you know, uh, or in their respective homes, and they are all coming to us here. We can talk to each other. Medicine without expert doctors. Education, wherever you are, and this specific India stack, which is really a combination of Jandhan and Aadhaar and mobile, which can pass direct benefits, which can transfer direct benefits to literally crores of people in the country. So all of that makes actually life quite easier. We can also reduce waste. You know, one can actually monitor the movement of farm produce from the farm to the table and cut down the cost. I was recently reading about a new tractor, uh, which was launched by John Deere in the US. Now it's a tractor which can do some 360 acres of uh, land, you no know, tilling and maintenance, etc. you know, 24 hour period. It has exceptionally good autonomous abilities and it can check an individual plant and an individual weed and address that as it moves along. And they believe that with that, we can cut down the use of pesticides by almost 80%. We can cut down the, the use of fertilizers by almost 80%. Imagine what kind of waste reduction it can mean. Production made to order, you know, in a decentralized way. You know, so very, very focused. All of this actually can help reduce the waste. So we can possibly see the world where the exploitation of energy and resources or energy materials goes down. The world could become cleaner and greener. We can possibly live with a time of more comfort and leisure. And I think everything which is drudgerous, dirty, or dangerous can be left to the machines. Now the question is, is the digital revolution a passing fad or a sweeping transformation? I think that's the question that we need to ask. The question is whether it will fundamentally change the economic structure and the way of life, or this is just one of those things that comes and goes. Luckily, the, uh, the free market economy gives us good indicators. So we very clearly you know if the people who are participant in the free market see something in the future that is likely to have a major impact, they put a little more money into it. And that's how the market valuations get decided. Now true that sometimes the market valuations are, um, are, are impacted by irrational exuberance, or sometimes there is a great deal of depression and we don't know, but at least it's a good indication. And if you had to look at what the current market trends show, here it is. So Tesla Motors, clearly which defines a vehicle as software on wheels or a software defined vehicle, their current valuation is the total of the next 10 auto companies. That includes GM and Ford and Stellantis and Volkswagen and I mean, you name every major company, Toyota. 
their valuation is equal to all of them put together. That is what the market expects the growth to be in such a software defined vehicle. If you look at the digital behemoths, you know, the, the Facebook and Apple and Amazon and uh, Microsoft and Google, their valuation, you know, they're like five out of 500, you know, 1% of the population, but they have 25% of the value of the market. So look what the market is expecting them uh, to perform. Even if you were to look at India, now we have this spate of uh, unicorns, 42 new entrants in this whole area, two thirds of them are essentially digital companies. So even in India, people believe that there is a lot of growth potential for the digital world. So clearly the digital revolution is not a passing fad, but it's possibly a global tsunami, which can truly make the world cleaner, gentler, and kinder. Can it? So let's look at the other way. Will this make you know, a world truly a better place? Will it create a world where no man is left behind? What about the cab guy who is losing his job? What about the farm laborer who might lose his job? So is this going to make a world which is where no man is left behind? Is it going to divide the world? Can it be used to hijack elections or promote hate or intolerance? As we know what happened in the US elections last time. Can it remotely command somebody else's car, which is while it is on the road? And we have had cases of that. Can it switch off power plants in enemy countries? Can it target drones to destroy somebody else's property? All of this are imminently possible. So what will these digital technologies, and by digital technologies, we mean a host of technologies, including software, hardware, telecom, 3D printing, synthetic biology, CRISPR and all that, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the um, immersive technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, what will they all mean to humanity? How is it going to affect our resilient economic growth? How will they affect various facets of this world? And we have today an exceptional group of panelists to talk about how will this revolution affect various facets of our world. So let me give a quick overview about who are we, or who do we have today on the panel? So we have, we have Bharat FIH, uh, represented by Josh Folger. Welcome Josh to, uh, to this panel discussion. As you know, Foxconn is world's leader in manufacturing. The phones that all of us use, the Apple phone, large number of them, or almost all of them are made by them. They operate across the world. And you can say that they are the cutting edge when it comes to any industrial manufacturing. And you know, Josh will talk to us about how he thinks uh, the, uh, the industry, uh, the, the digital revolution is likely to affect his industry. We have uh, David Mansfield uh, from Vinfast. Vinfast is a part of a Vietnamese group, the largest Vietnamese group, uh, which is engaged in all aspects of work in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, uh, no, David is the, is the CFO of the uh, company and he is specifically looking after the emerging electrical vehicles business. It's a major area for growth uh, for them. And I think it's a turning point for the entire humanity. We have uh, also Samir Nair, uh, who is the CEO of Applause Entertainment. Now, you know, probably no other industry is more directly affected uh, by the digital revolution than media and entertainment. You know, with these millions of smartphones in practically everybody's hand, I think the impact is huge. So we have Samir with us, uh, who can, uh, you know, who is going to talk to us about what's the impact on media and entertainment. And we have Vijay Karnani. Uh, Vijay is the former India head of Goldman Sachs, uh, world's largest financial powerhouse. And uh, finance is where you can see um, a reflection of what is likely to be tomorrow. And Vijay is there with us to talk about the impact of this uh, revolution on, uh, on, 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 the, on the world, on the world of finance. So the panel touches virtually the complete cross spectrum of industry, trade and commerce. And they're going to tell us what does the new digital world mean to their industry? 
how has it altered their industry equally importantly how is it going to change their industry in times to come and in this new era what will who will be the winners and who will be the losers so with this in mind i would like to now turn to them so first to you josh now as i said manufacturing is the core of your operations and manufacturing has been affected by digital revolution very significantly so what have you seen in the last few years happening and how do you see the future in times to come how do you think it will affect the industry as a whole over to you josh thank you ravi and uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening to everybody who's tuning in it's a ple pleasure and privilege to be here on a very important topic and i really uh, appreciate the the uh, uh, the people who have envisioned this and the government of india on, on such an important measure Uh, so today we are living in an extremely connected world. Um, I think we've seen digital revolution everywhere, 80s, 90s, 2000s. We've seen connectivity improve. Uh, and uh, yes, I think you talked about electronics uh, and uh, the advent of mobile phones. Uh, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of making mobile phones for 20, 25 years, um, uh, a lot of the time in India. and uh, and uh, indeed cranked out uh, millions and billions and they have transformed the world and uh, but this has this space has not stopped the space is continuing to gain momentum and uh, the good news about this industry is it's very uh, this uh, uh, especially the telecom industry uh, this is very very uh, progressed in a very very nice manner uh, and uh, and now what uh, um what has happened is that this is now propelling the electronics market uh in india uh you know currently from about 91 uh, billion dollars uh, uh this this financial year to uh, close to 300 uh, billion dollars uh, in financial year 2026 so clearly uh, a massive progress and making this one of the top uh, three uh, exports Uh, by 2026 in india and uh, a, a significant portion about 120 billion of this will be exported uh, you know out of uh, out of india and uh, and and this is the all of this are government uh, uh, ministry of electronics uh, and it forecast and uh, and this intent is 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 definitely backed you know by the government uh, uh, because all of this digital governance uh uh initiatives uh, which the government has has done is setting up on this on this uh, on our ability to uh, provide this hardware at uh, at the right uh, you know uh, uh, sort of uh, spaces you know for the people uh so so what we see is the government of india uh, really promoting uh you know through either through uh you know building design ecosystems uh, attractive schemes Uh, like uh, like uh, the PLI to really promote uh, large scale uh, manufacturing and also developing a very um, uh, resilient supply chain uh, you know which will which will stay the course and support uh, you know this particular cause so so i think uh, you know as we go uh, and this journey is not new in india you know but uh, it's it's been going on uh i'll i'll say uh, definitely you know for the last 15 years uh but covid has accelerated uh, uh you know this uh this phenomenon and uh, and has created new dynamics around the world in india uh you know has definitely uh digitized itself you know uh, be it uh you know the education system the medical system our factories uh, located uh, you know around the country all of them had to very quickly learn to digitize so that the digital timetable uh you know sort of just got compressed uh, uh you know as we went through the three waves in india and uh, and then therefore we definitely see that uh that this digitization will continue to play a big role uh, on the manufacturing floor and also also as uh, you know uh, you know as you as you as you rightly said uh, a mobile phone has replaced uh, you know on a good day five maybe even 10 devices 
and uh, and I've seen that journey, uh, you know, through uh, through my through my career, and and that is going to uh, sort of have an impact, a very desired impact on the work. So back to you, Ravi. On the shop floor, what changes have you seen over the last few years because of the digital revolution? So I think in the shop floor, uh, you know, your shop floor is a very dynamic uh, space, regardless of the type of manufacturing. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of paperwork, you know, the tracking materials, uh, the attendance systems, you know, for the people, uh, all those things, uh, you know, uh, you know, had to be digitized, uh, you know, as we, as we sort of uh, uh, get into uh, higher technology, higher speed and, and with COVID, you know, a sort of a no touch, uh, you know, type, uh, uh, you know, scenario, all of this. And, and, and then, you know, you know, if, if I, if I dial back to, uh, Feb 2020, uh, I mean, some of that was not there, not even imagined. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it is, it is, it was put in place rapidly. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so clearly, I, and I don't see that stopping, um, you know, as we, as we progress, uh, openness to, uh, you know, automation, uh, e uh, even in Asia, uh, uh, I'm actually a robotics engineer, and uh, yes, I was going to come to that. Is, yes, <laughs> yeah, it's just been it's about it's been about 20, 20 years since I've uh, programmed a robot, you know. But uh, uh, you know, but 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 I think it's 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 back, uh, you know, back in fashion again, uh, you know, and uh, in in uh, in in especially in Asia Pacific, and uh, and so definitely see uh, you know that trend continuing across the span of industries. And, uh, and and then just being responsible as we go through this. Very interesting. So David, let me come to you. So you represent actually one of the fastest growing uh, companies in Vietnam. Uh, you represent the company's ambition in the world of electric mobility and um, you're looking at the global market. Now, um, and I would ask you a question as a, so to say a representative of the mobility industry. How do you see the change uh, in the mobility industry. Um, how, how do you see the change now and you know in the future, in the next maybe 10 years or so? Um, sure, well, the first, uh, thank you very much, Ravi, for the invitation to participate and, uh, and also uh, thanks for the, uh, the participation of the fellow distinguished panelists. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be talking to you all today. So how is the, how is, uh, the digital revolution changing um, the auto industry? Um, well, that's something we think about a lot at, at VinFast. So we, we think about that in, in, in terms of how uh, the, the products we're going to create. Actually, many of the things that you talked about in your introduction really resonated uh, with me. Some of the questions about, um, you know, will technology be used for good, for bad? What can we do? What can we achieve with it? Because those kind of questions really inform uh, how VinFast and Vin Group in particular thinks about uh, technology. Um, so they, you know, they, they we have a, as a, as a group a mission statement of uh, improving the lives of uh, of all of the people uh, in Vietnam. And I guess now, as we take our electric vehicles global, we're, we're kind of trying to improve the the lives of people uh, by providing kind of clean uh, transportation and e-mobility around the world. How has uh, technology, uh, uh, coming back to your question, though, how has technology impacted uh, the auto industry? Um, I, I think um, I'll draw a parallel with the, um, the the mobile industry. Actually, as Josh was talking about the, the mobile industry, I think um, you know you, you talked about with uh, with Tesla, uh, you know, cars and EVs becoming software on wheels. I think we're seeing with electric vehicles um, the implementation of technology really creates, um, uh, like uh, you said, a smartphone or a smart uh, consumer device uh, on wheels. And that transformation has really picked up pace in the last uh, few years. Uh, so similar and in a parallel way to the transformation from you know the Nokia phone through to the smartphone in the uh, early part of the century, uh, you know it, it opens up a huge uh, world of business opportunities, of uh, value opportunities for improving people's lives, uh, reducing uh, complexity, uh, and you know uh, providing convenience uh, for people. Um, so. When we, when we look at that, we see that as an opportunity. Um, we think about what kind of technology we're gonna stick in our cars to make people's lives uh, easier. And uh, from our perspective, not necessarily all of the uh, uh, manufacturers, but from VinFast perspective, we'd like to 
think of the, uh, you know, we have a, a phrase technology for life and, and how we can put technology in cars that makes people's lives more convenient uh, um, and safer in, in particular. So when we're implementing uh, AI in cars for advanced driving, um, we have safety uh, at the forefront of our minds for, uh, you know, functionality like, uh, you know, lane change and traffic uh, assist. Um, you know, blind spot detection. Um, we have uh, we have some really smart facial recognition software that goes into the cars to make sure that uh, drivers are alert and awake. Um, you know, so safety very much at the forefront um, when we when we put technology in the cars. Um, also, convenience uh, is another big factor for us, and uh, so we think about. What do people not like doing when they're driving their cars? So one of those things is parking them. So, you know, we're developing functionality to auto park the car and auto summon uh, the car, uh, you know, get it back when you when you finish. Um, so, you know, this, uh, the, the development of the car and the transformation of the car from, uh, you know, what was, uh, I guess, historically a mechanical device to one that's now truly a digital device opens up a whole array of, of different opportunities uh, for us to implement smart and interesting functionality in the cars. Um, and not just for us, but for, for other uh, uh, industry participants as well. So um, yeah, I think opportunity is at the core of, uh, of the transformation uh, in answer to your question. You see, uh, David, the, uh, again, your shop floor changing because of the digital, uh, you know, uh, the revolution. But yeah, it's great, great question. I think, um, so ours is a relatively uh, modern uh, factory uh, by comparison to other OEMs and probably historical standards. So we, we established our business in 2017 and we built uh, our factory site uh, at the poor city of Haiphong in Vietnam. Uh, on our, you know, we did it uh, incredibly quickly, incredibly efficiently. In, in about 12 months, we built it from uh, the ground up on reclaimed land. But we specifically invested up front uh, in you know, a highly automated, highly um, uh, kind of robotic uh, manufacturing process. Uh, and in doing so, we created one of the most modern uh, manufacturing facilities in Southeast Asia. Um, if you have the opportunity to go and see it, please do. It's very impressive. Um, but in that, and in that automation, we, we really tried to embrace, I guess, what people think of as um, industry 4.0. Uh, and, and Josh mentioned some of the uh, manufacturing processes that, uh, you know, are related to that, uh, you know, the switch from paperwork to digital. Um, we have an incredibly, uh, uh, you know, uh, automated process, but we gather a huge amount of data in the, the manufacturing process, um, which is all kind of gathered and, and stored in our, in our cloud that um, tracks every aspect of the vehicle, every aspect of the people involved in the manufacturing of the vehicle. Um, and it allows us to optimize and become efficient um, and identify areas for improvement in, in the manufacturing process. Really, it's, it's, it's one of the things that allows us to operate um, at scale and to, to kind of produce, as we do, many different varieties of car on the same uh, production line uh, in parallel and just uh, configure and change uh, to accommodate new varieties and new models on the production line. So I think... How has technology changed? And answer to your question, well, we've invested to you know, make a modern uh, and digital driven manufacturing process. It allows us to compete um, with the likes of Tesla, hopefully, and, uh, and other of the major uh, modern manufacturing companies. Very interesting, David, thank you. You know, from the world of manufacturing and automotives, uh, let's turn to the uh, world of media and entertainment. And uh, so uh, this is for you, Samir. Uh, you know, I mean, there is just uh, so much happening in your space. You know, uh, as I said in my initial remark, probably theaters are uh, going to be less used than before. How do you protect the intellectual property in the world of the, in this digital world? Now they're talking about movies without actors and actresses because they can be synthetically made. Um, they are talking about, you know, the driver for the industry is um, advertisement. And uh, I heard recently 90% of digital advertisement is going to uh, Facebook and Google. So how does it, you know, affect the industry? How do you see the changes happening in the last few years? And where do you see your world moving in the next few years? Well, thank you, Ravi. Thank you for inviting us here. And you know, pleasure to be on this wonderful panel. 
Um, you know, the media business, like unlike manufacturing and unlike you know, all the core sectors, often is treated like, you know, it's like a soft sector. You know, it's there, it touches all our lives, it touches your life, it touches everyone's life. We are currently on media doing this conference. And yet it's sort of, you know, much, it's also on the sidelines. It's not such a big, you know, it's not such a big deal, but actually it is. So the transformation, this digital transformation actually for the media business, because, you know, we're the first ones to get affected by anything has been going on for quite a while. So it's really from the early 90s when the internet started. So with the start of the internet, it straight away affected media, it affected print, it affected, you know, what definition of a website, blogs, all of that came up at the same time. Uh, as it went along, satellite TV came, mobile telephony came, you know, a big disruptor that happened in the 2000s was film distribution, you know, prints used to go physically to all the theaters and suddenly it became digital. So that like put an entire section of business, you know, just gone bust. Um, and it's been growing, then came the social media, mobile telephony grew, um, you know, all of this internet driven video became a big deal. And now finally, in the 2010s, we've seen the rise of the streamers. Right. So in a sense, and I've been in the business a long time, and what I've found is that consumers are consumers and content is content. And what has really changed is the manner in which we consume the content. Right. So there's been major technological change in distribution of how this con uh, these, whether movies or news or sport is delivered to these consumers. Um, now we are living in a world where there are a billion devices in India, uh, there are smartphones, um, you know, everybody and their uncle is on WhatsApp, uh, everyone has access to YouTube and Facebook and all of that. And that comes with its pros and cons, you know, so one, of course, the big pro in this is that everything has become that much more democratic, right? In the old days, I remember when, you know, if you were the, you know, the, the boss of the house, you're the one reading the paper and probably your help or your driver don't have access to the same information. Uh, now, I think they know more than us, right? Because they've got more time while you're working, they're still you know, watching news and doing stuff. <laughs> I think that's a good thing that's happened. I think, you know, access has improved for everyone. Everyone can be in the business. But on the flip side, what's also happened is that it's obviously affected the economics. It's affected piracy. Um, it affects, you know, the ability to monetize all this. Um, and different things are happening. So there's a large growth of what we call subscription driven services, which do not have advertising. So if you take the example of Netflix, Netflix has about 220 million customers globally. These are the most premium customers in the world. And if they spend watching three hours of Netflix a day, uh, that means there are 1 billion people not coming in contact with any regular advertising. They don't know what the latest Pepsi commercial is because they haven't seen it. So, I mean, that's happening on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, it's all the rest of it. No, no free lunch. So someone's got to pay for it. So it's all advertising supported. And that is being driven by the big technology companies and giants. So I think we are in interesting times as media goes. Um, the, what the media company do, always do is that they sort of adapt, evolve or die either way. But two things sort of remain kind of constant. At the end of it all, there's always a consumer in front of a screen of some kind. And uh, the screen has got to deliver some kind of content to them, which they must consume. So what's been changing for us, I guess, is the way content is distributed. In many ways, the way content is created, um, you know, like technology has improved. You mentioned, you know, about not needing actors and actresses so that, you know, you could have animated versions of them. I think just to correct that a bit, you still need Shah Rukh Khan. You just don't need him physically. You still need his name and his face and his IP to continue to monetize it in that manner. And I think the most important thing that's changed is the way con consumers consume content. You know, they are, they, we, I mean, the one hand we say that, you know, they've got really short attention spans and everything really, you know, there's no time for anything. And on the other hand, we talk about binging, where people are watching, you know, a show for six hours in a row. So I think everything is changing and nothing is changing. Very interesting, very interesting. So, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> content you think will have a major role going forward. What would be the, what would hold the industry? Uh, what would be the anchor of the industry if advertisement gets, so to say, segregated to some? But actually at the end of it all, um, it is really a consumer who is consuming something, you know, whether short form or long form reading, uh, catching up with the news or watching a sporting event or seeing a movie. Um, so I think those kind of see human beings are at, at their very core storytellers and story listeners, you know, now we of course like to say that human beings are storytellers, but that's a few of us. 
Uh, the rest of this species are story listeners. You know, they like to sit around listening to stories, uh, which I think will continue to happen. Um, how that happens and how that gets monetized is very important. Because obviously, when you have to create quality content, it costs money to do. And there must be a way to sort of recover that money. You know, I mean, there's got to be some sort of, you know, economic model to this. And I think that's where the struggle is. I guess what's happening to the industry now is that, no, obviously, the arrival of the big tech giants is, you know, in a way dwarfing the content companies because the tech companies, of course, come with different business models, right? And for them, the content business becomes a sort of a rounding off error or an add-on. Um, whereas for the content company, it is, you know, life and blood and sweat and you know, that's all going on there. So those are these are things that will play out. But in the final analysis, it still comes down to uh, content being created. And I think all of these coexist. See, when there were theaters and when TV first came, everyone said theaters are going to be dead. But that didn't happen. When the internet came, people said TV is going to be dead. But that didn't happen. Now that streaming devices have taken over completely, people think everything else is going to happen. But even if you look at the streaming devices, when you look at your Netflix, what are you watching? You're watching TV shows and movies, right? When you're on social media, you're looking at photos and looking at short form video and doing those kind of things. Um, so, I mean, Twitter is a buzz with news. You know, we get our news from Twitter and not from the newspapers, but it's from the Twitter handle of a newspaper, you know? So in that sense, I think um, while these changes are happening, the key thing is going to be about how to be able to effectively monetize it. And these are challenges that are very real because, you know, there is fragmentation. There is at one level, you know, very strong consolidation. You know, the industry is sort of gravitating towards a couple of giants wanting to rule the roost. But again, those things never play out because, you know, there's always fragmentation. There's always regulation. Um, just today in the papers, you know, all the big, all the governments, whenever there's big tech, there is always big government, right? And, uh, you know, there are always populist measures, all sorts of things happen. So I think this is an exciting time. The biggest thing that's happened to the media industry is the arrival of the global streamer, uh, which actually allows consumers to consume content anywhere from anywhere, right? Across borders, across languages, with no sort of time, with no ad interruptions, all of that. And I think that is revolutionary. I think that is revolutionary. I think that's only going to grow in the next... 10, 20 years. And of course, all the other, you know, little bit of science fiction stuff will happen, the metaverse. And I think these are early days. You know, I think half the world's population is quite poor. So, you know, I think there's a time for that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, coming to you, Vijay. So, you know, I was, um, uh, I was reading this very famous economist, uh, Carlos Perez. And uh, what one reads is that every change happens in three phases. Huh? The first phase is the world of finance knows the future than any, before anybody else. And finance decides you know, where the money will get directed. Then uh, out of that finance, a lot of infrastructure investment happens. And then people suddenly realize that you know, this investment is infrastructure is too much. And then after that, the consumers wake up and they start using the infrastructure. So I think finance is the bellwether. And uh, so I want to hear from you. Uh, how is the world of finance looking at digital? How do you see uh, the world itself, the finance world itself affected by it? Whether you are looking at um, all the way from, you know, venture capital to public markets, where do you see the changes happening? Where do you see the changes happening across the world? Because now, truly, in the field of finance, the world is one single village. So how do you look at this, Vijay? Uh, thank you, Ravi. That's, uh, those are great questions. Thank you for inviting me to the panel. Uh, just to answer your question, you know, tech has always been an integral part of finance. You know, it is one of the largest cost centers of any financial world. You know, the, it's just gone hand in hand over the years. But the current fintech revolution is now exponential. Um, and it's growing and it's been, you know, so far it's been very slow to disrupt this sector. Other sectors have been disrupted much faster. And, and there are reasons for that. You know, this sector has some natural barriers which are now being overcome. So for example, number one, there's something called trust and credibility. You know, you put your money where it's always considered to be safe. And we'll talk a little more about that at a later point. Second is regulations. This is the most regulated industry on the planet and regulations always solve for the most conservative risk profile. So it's very difficult to get over that. 
And the third is incumbents act. Um, you know, they're well capitalized and they don't stop innovating when new products and technologies come available. So these are, you know, natural barriers, which now we are, you know, observing that, you know, people are able to sort of overcome some of them as well. Now, what is going on currently in India? Let's just take an example of India. You mentioned India, India stack. Uh, this was developed by Nanda Nilekani and the iSpirit organization. And we should all really be thankful to them uh, and the government for, you know, the work they've done. This is just phenomenal groundbreaking work. Essentially, it's an open set of APIs, right? Uh, which basically solve for three requirements, identity, payments, and data. Uh, and it's completely changed things such as payments, like you can see what UPI has done, um, the KYC process, opening bank accounts. Now which is just done instantly as opposed to, you know, and also at, at a much lower cost. So for example, UPI now has, it's bigger than credit cards and net banking combined. And it's, it's the preferred way to pay in India. Um, EKYC opened up bank accounts in the first seven years, what it would have taken us 50 years if we did it by traditional methods. And according to some World Bank estimates, it used to cost $23 to open an account, not cost like 15 cents. So it's dramatically, you know, brought down costs. Now, and several applications have been built on the system. So, you know, a host of new companies have come through in insurance, in lending and capital markets. And, you know, we're all benefiting with all this. Now, if you look at traditional finance, there are three main broad uh, sort of revenue sources. It's fees, it's lending, um, and it's investments. Now fees, you can see anything that is a fee uh, oriented sort of uh, company, you can see the disruption in the incumbents as well as in new companies. So that's being a lot, you know, you can see it being commoditized and, you know, India Stack explains that. Second is lending. Lending is much harder. Lending, you know, you require a bit of a skill set. Um, I mean, you require skill set in all of them, but lending, you know, the, the sort of uh, experience really helps. And people with an offline experience who can create a much more efficient system would probably be winners. But then they are now being challenged by, um, you know, smart contracts coming out in crypto. Um, and, 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 and there's an Auken framework that has been created now which is a similar framework as what um, UPI did for payments. So it's going to make lending much easier. So yeah, that's something that we've got to keep a lookout for. And the third is investing. Investing is something that um, look, we now pass through a huge amount of data. So tech can only help us pass through that. And secondly, new AI sort of products are coming through, which basically um, develop better money management tools or products. So this is an ongoing challenge to incumbents as well, right? Now, how do we navigate all this through the, to the future, right? Um, you know, for that, you've got to look through what central banks did in the last 25 years. Just, just see the recent history. So if you, if you think that through this, the 1998 credit crisis through LTCM, um, the 2000 tech bubble, the 2008 housing collapse, you know, now this 2020 COVID. Basically central banks, um, they address the debt bubble and they use tools aggressively to bring down rates and to issue currencies. And basically what they did was rescue the financial system from insolvency. So they kept the system solvent. If it hadn't, you know, we, none of us would be here. Um, but they didn't solve the debt problem. They basically uh, created you know, tools which actually debased currencies. Now, after the 2008 crisis, there was a whole bunch of discussions going on. And, you know, then came the birth of de decentralized finance. Um, and Bitcoin came into being in 2010. And basically it came as a, uh, with, with two basically, two, um, two things in mind. One, that it was gonna be a store of value um, to protect yourself from debasement. Um, and the second one was that, you know, it's a call option to the future, right? Um, now the blockchain tech is elegant. It, it's, it's simple, it's secure, it's efficient, it works. I'm not gonna argue about, talk about pricing. Pricing is an entirely different animal. There's so many different opinions about this. That's why it's become a highly volatile asset. 
Um, but you know that will also settle down as you know you start getting um, uh, basically you know valuation th uh, theses come out in terms of how to value these. But that's a different different discussion. What I'm talking about the tech itself. What's important to recognize is that an entirely new financial system is being created, which is an alternate to the traditional one, right? And you can't ignore that. It's got, you know, it, it, it's basically got everything inside it. It's got lending, securities, you know, every product that we sort of deal with in the traditional world, we are now dealing in that world. And it's efficient. It's 24-7. Um, and it's secure in the sense that these systems are de designed so that as more people come on them, the security actually increases. So given that, you know, the one thing that I talk about, one of the barriers of entry of security, you know, this is basically as more and more people are getting onto it, uh, it's something that is, it's quite interesting and you can't ignore it. As of last year, and the end of last year, about 300 million people uh, were using some sort of crypto somewhere, right? Um, but if you say 300 million versus 7 billion, which use fiat currencies, so 300 divided by 7,000, that's what, about 4%. So it's still in the incumbent stage, you know, infancy stage in terms of where we want to get to. But what we have to watch out is how this develop. These networks are going to grow exponentially. They're going to follow Metcalf's law. They're going to, you know, be very, very important. Um, but what the most interesting thing coming to us now is how the regulators are going to act to this. Um, and we can see that in India, a bit of that going on, and you can see that all around the world. But this is something that will bring the world closer. So you've got a decentralized world as well as a world that is, uh, you know, controlled by central banks. And this discussion is going to be what I think in the next, um, you know, few years is going to just play itself out. Um, now, uh, people are saying that a company like uh, Alibaba or a company like um, um, Amazon has a deep connect with their uh, supplier network. They understand the performance of their suppliers and they probably are the um, right uh, lenders uh, to help in their trade. Uh, so that is one chunk which is going away from the current traditional business of banks. Uh, <clears throat> There are multiple ways in which people can invest their money now directly. Um, and, you know, as you rightly said, although the, um, the time to open a bank account has gone down, one wonders how many people would actually like to have a bank account going forward. What would be the role of the bank vis-a-vis uh, -vis these new fintech companies who are turning into uh, super banks? It's a great question, but remember one thing that, you know, banks didn't cover the entire economy or entire set of people. There were so many unbanked people and there were so many people that were in the community. So financial inclusion was not even close to being complete in a country like India or any of the emerging markets, right? So people didn't have access to credit. They didn't ha have access to bank accounts. They didn't ha have access to the direct payments. So this is closing that gap. And you're taking out a lot of bad behavior in the financial world, you know, my aggressive money lenders in some of these small villages and things like that. So one is that, you know, remember that, you know, as a bank like HDFC or a Kotak or, a, you know, uh, one of these large banks is not just going to disappear. They are working towards becoming more efficient. So for example, let's say that your bank decided not to do UPI payments or it did not allow, it, it took like five days as it used to be to open a bank account. That bank's not going to survive. So all of them have adjusted to, you know, what the new regime looks like. Now, in terms of captive, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, communities such as what Alibaba has or like in India, what Bajaj Finance has, for example, yes, they will be able to monetize those facilities a little better than other banks. But that doesn't stop you from, as a consumer, to go to another place where you know you might get a better rate or you might get some better access to better financial products. So what has happened is there are parts of finance which are going to be commoditized. So payments, for example, is commoditized. Anyone can establish a payments company. But why do you use one versus the other is, is the user experience or it might be a better rate or it might suit you as a person better for whatever reason, right? So that's where people are going to compete and as long as you're in the technology curve in terms of where the edge is, 
as long as you're there, I think the incumbents have a very, very strong part to play. So I don't think they disappear. Interesting. So, you know, uh, so we have looked at what is happening in these four segments of the economy. Um, I think the question that um, uh, comes uh, uh, into mind is, um, you know, the industry structures are changing and uh, uh, what, who could be the potential winners and losers in this new game? So Josh, coming to you, for example, now, you know, uh, you represent um, a large, um, highly technically competent um, manufacturing setup. And now there are segments in the whole manufacturing industry, starting with MSMEs uh, to as advanced uh, uh, a, a setup like yours. So in this new world, how do you think the winners and losers are going to shape up? How do you think that is going to affect the industry as a whole? I think, uh, you know, I mean, I think as Samir mentioned, I think, uh, and then as Yuan Vijay was mentioning, uh, you know, the incumbents, you know, if they don't adopt, you know, they, you know, they will lose out, right? I think that's the very common law you can apply. So I'm not going to focus so much on the losers. I think I'm going to talk about winners. And I think it's going to be across the spectrum of things. All of these things, uh, you know, we've been doing the electronics hardware, uh, you know, has, has been a, you know, game changer that has been uh, a, a, a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, consolidation happening of, of products. Uh, uh, you know what David leads uh, uh, in 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 uh, uh, you know the it's it's a massive convergence opportunity. There are people who say that an automotive is now an ICT product. Uh, you know, which is uh, a blasphemy a few years ago. Uh, and 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 I think so. So uh, you know, companies uh, you know which are in this space of creating scale, uh, uh, you know, across the different tiers of the supply chain, uh, large players, medium-sized players, ancillary units. I think they all stand to benefit as long as you are ready to invest. So electronics manufacturing services, uh, you know, have really enabled, uh, you know, uh, by investing in technology, investing in, in, in service adoption, uh, designing, uh, you know, products, which are are, uh, are are meeting the needs, uh, you know, uh, you know, so that uh, so that it services all parts of the economy. So so I think uh, I, you know I, I really think that uh, the, the future is 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 very secure as as uh, as in India, you know, as an example, where there is uh, over the last seven years under the Make in India program now with Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, you know, we have a very very specific focus. On, on, on supporting uh, the manufacturing, the design the manufacturing, uh, you know, capital goods which support that, uh, uh, you know, to, to, re to really promote uh, these things. So I, I really think there are definitely going to be winners who, who, who just are ready to adopt and uh, adapt. Back to you, Ravi. So, so what I hear you say is that those who adapt quickly uh, to the new world, are the ones who will become really like the uh, major winners in this area. So David, uh, you know, we talked about the auto industry being in a flux, you know? So, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the customers are changing his preferences. Uh, companies like yours coming in uh, with the best of the technologies, while there are behemoths in the world who have been using uh, technologies built over 30, 40, 50 years. How do you see uh, your industry, the play in the industry panning out? Yeah, I think, so I think that's uh, related to the, the concept of, you know, who's going to be the winners and the losers, uh, you know, and, and uh, who's going to, to thrive in that market and that industry. Um, I'd, I'd like to tell you very confidently that VinFast will be one of the, the winners uh, uh, over, mm -hmm. over time. Um, yes. But actually, I think uh, the industry is changing so much. I mean, historically, the uh, industry and the OEM um, uh, in, uh, kind of facets of manufacturing had become a very commoditized uh, uh, business where you were effectively an aggregator of uh, materials and, and kind of reliant on a very complex and, and diverse supply chain. Um, and outsourcing a lot of the work and, and really you were kind of a, a component aggregator in terms of the ultimate product you delivered. What we've learned in recent years is uh, the requirements 
um, are changing from that very definitely. So from a supply chain perspective, um, you're seeing a huge amount, at least in, uh, in, in particular in the EV industry, uh, vertical integration, um, you know, how many uh, EV or how many uh, auto manufacturers are entering into uh, JVs with battery supply companies, how many of them are beginning to manufacture, uh, you know, their own batteries, we, we are beginning to do that, we're beginning to manufacture our own uh, supplies. And in some cases, you see um, some companies go one step further and, and trying to source their own raw material supplies. So that's one way that uh, the, the auto companies are, are changing. They're having to become much more vertically integrated, but they're also changing from uh, uh, mechanical manufacturing companies into software companies as well. And um, you know, again, I mentioned some of the the, the key aspects of uh, software that we're developing. Not all of the uh, traditional OEM players are either good at software uh, and and software writing, or necessarily well suited or well uh, set up to have you know have the skill set to be able to write uh, good software whether that's for you know infotainment or you know customer experience in terms of websites and mobile apps or for advanced driving so i think th those are two very key ways that kind of you know the automotive uh, industry is really changing and uh, i would say uh, we see probably some of the traditional players uh, will struggle uh, in in that and that's what we believe creates uh, such a, a rich and uh, opportunity for new entrants like ourselves uh, to be able to apply technology and uh, and, and compete. So yeah, I can I, I guess I can I can tell you confidently maybe that uh, Tesla for sure will be amongst uh, the, the winners, and uh, you know the next uh, th you know positions two through ten uh, I, I confidently predict that Vinfast will be there, and I, I couldn't tell you who the other nine will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So, Samir, you mentioned that uh, the content is going to be the winner. Hmm? But, you know, if you look at the game of content creation, who will create? Uh, and in that whole game, secondly, who will win uh, the oxygen, which is the advertisement? And in that context, who you think will be the winners or the losers in your industry? Well, you know, actually, well, as Josh said, let's not talk about the losers because losers will be the ones who fail to adapt and die and all of that. Yeah. But, you know, there are two, three things happening. One is that obviously in the media business, there is the invasion of the big tech companies that are alien to the business, but have now come in. Um, there are the existing traditional players, all of them are there. And many of them have adapted very well, have grown, have actually now become tech companies in their own right. Uh, what is happening is that it's really important for all companies in the media space to actively embrace the digital world. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we are consumer facing companies, you're talking to consumers, and there are many things that affect consumers, most importantly, experience, right? So like, one, on the one hand, there is, of course, content, and then there is the experience of consuming that content, right? So you need smooth technology, you need smooth, uh, seamless technology, because you're always being compared with other services that are available. So, you know, so like you compare it to a car, you compare it to an airline, you compare it to, you know, a payment gateway. You know, if all of those things work well, then why doesn't your app work well? You know, those kind of things. So I think that's really important. The other thing is, of course, going to be a question of scale. Customer acquisition is an expensive business, right? And so you've got to acquire customers, you've got to retain customers, and then you've got to make money, right? So this is a difficult business. So in which we have, you know, real big giants who've come in here with you no know, huge horizons. You know, people look at this business 20 years out, 30 years out. You know, they're talking not about industry share. They're talking about share of wallet. You know, they're talking about, you know, how much did this consumer spend on a clutch of services of telecom, of entertainment, of television, and of, you know, how much do you spend for that? And then that total number becomes a monthly number and that into a hundred million or 200 million or 500 million into 20 years becomes an absurd number. And then you can invest for that. So, I mean, all of those things are going on. You know, there are foreign players, there are domestic players. Um, at center, I think of all this, there are always two key things. One is that, you know, you these wars are won or lost on the quality of your content. Right, because it has, and it is increasingly has to become better because your consumer is exposed to global content. Right, the consumer is no longer living in little bubbles. See, we lived in little, little geographic and language bubbles. You know, we did Hindi entertainment, 
you know malayalam movie you know those kind of things that's all gone now everything is available to everyone and everyone is seeing different things so obviously the standard is going up second thing is price you know because indians are supposed to be very value conscious country and you know we don't you know spend too easily or too much so i mean that becomes a big play so it's an interesting time um you know it it really borders on you know how well we can improve the quality of what we do and how well we can improve the experience of the consumer who's getting that um and i think people who focus on that and there are there are many takers for it i mean companies like amazon netflix uh, the geo business you know the disney hotstar i mean there are so many of them you know so many big players in the food chain we are relatively smaller we are content creators you know we 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 create content and we supply it to even bigger chains who then proceed to aggregate and give it to even bigger chains you know so it's a big food chain but at the heart of it is you know you got to entertain and delight people very interesting so the same question to you vijay you know uh, obviously you know if we were to look at segments of your industry uh, say the pe's or the vcs or the banks or clearing homes or broking services etc those who are more adaptable will win but if you look at the whole spectrum of industry and you look at players by players in various segments how do you see the things changing who would be um, potentially garnering a bigger pie of the business yeah it's too broad a question uh, ravi so there there's going to be winners in every you know there's so many silos of our business but you know you can see that you know uh, for example venture capitals have done really really well you know, assuming that they get the right sort of trades on right um there's a huge amount of work being done like i said in the blockchain world so there are thousands and thousands of companies coming along winners in our space can come from anywhere this is the first time it can come from anywhere previously it used to be an incumbent the incumbent used to like uh, you know uh, service providers like bloomberg haven't been dislodged for more than 30 35 years right i mean he's got a phenomenal product and you know the financial industry swears by it um you could have dislodged him but you know there is a network that's built around which is difficult to do but this is the first time at least in let's say in the last you know whatever in the past five or seven years that you can start seeing people getting dislodged and the winners can come from anywhere so for example you know i don't know if you've heard of uh, the polygon founder polygon is a um, crypto chain uh, there's a the founder's name is jayanti kanani he's based out of ahmedabad you know he basically saw an opportunity um in terms of the ethereum network where he saw the gas rates which is the basically the cost was too high and the efficiency was the the time it took um was too slow so he created an alternative um you know chain now this company is worth 12 billion dollars right and this is just started a few years ago so and this is just one person and a couple of other founders who basically saw an opportunity in a space and decided okay we're going to go and attack it they didn't disrupt anything they didn't go any they just made a system which was already existing better and you know uh, the same thing is happening with some of the banks they are you your experience with a bank you might not necessarily need to go to a bank there's a lot of places now there um, mm-hmm. you know how you go into an apple store and there's nobody there with a cash counter you probably have a bank now where there'll just be people there'll be no tellers nothing and you everything is digital and you know that 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 time is coming um then there's the whole nft space uh, you know this is obviously the sort of the most aggressive part of valuation that's going on but you you've got to discuss this as well because there's a huge amount of innovation going on and this is where samir's world and my world meet um so you know examples like and this is the crazy stuff that's going on that people are buying lamborghinis in the virtual world for $360,000 which is the same as buying a physical lamborghini but their argument is the physical lamborghini depreciates this one in the virtual world you can rent out you get a yield and it doesn't depreciate when you, people use it in other games so this is a kind of forward thinking that's going on right now and it's um i can just say that the winners can come from you know any part of the world um and you don't necessarily have to be in the states or in uh, uh, in the western europe you can do it from india you can do it from russia you can do it not russia russia is a, got a bit of an issue right now but um uh you can do it from anywhere um and that's the beauty about you know where this world is going to so it's it's really uh, making a level playing field across a lot of places very 
Exciting, very exciting. So Shilpa, do we have questions uh, from the audience? I think you're, you're tracking them, right? Yeah, um, thanks Dr. Pandit. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we le Let me start off with the first question I see here. Uh, it says, uh, talking about resilience, we have seen that even minor technological disruptions on such a large scale can cause difficulties for uh, the general population. While we are still transitioning to a majorly digital world, how much focus is given to fail safes? For example, if banks often, uh, banks often face problems on their digital platforms, um, observed in India, how would the industry work to give people confidence in digital functions at this moment? And maybe we can ask all of our panelists to um, share some experiences in this regard. Uh, adaptability and building confidence as they move or migrate towards more digital um, industry. Thank you. So I think the question is basically about the safety, <laughs> safety of a digital infrastructure. And I think that is equally relevant for every one of the panelists. Josh, what if what if the automated machines in a lights out factory, uh, you know, misbehaves? You know, it, <laughs> it 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 creates a product that was not supposed to be created, or uh, it hurts someone who is on the shop floor. I actually almost did that in 1999. You know, so so we had a you know completely automated factory making mobile phones, and uh, yeah, we didn't switch off the lights, you know. But uh, but uh, no, I think see the uh, see I think the the fail safes have been part of manufacturing uh, services, lockout, tagouts, um, when you do maintenance and uh, safety curtains, uh, environmentally friendly uh, practices. Uh, you know, all those things have been very much part of uh, uh, electronics manufacturing, you know, uh, you know, and when you extend that a little bit, uh, you know, uh, even when you get into uh, other aspects of manufacturing, zero discharge, um, uh, being lead free has been standard for more than 25 years in our space. So, so I think, uh, you know, I, I probably didn't answer the, the question which uh, this, this person uh, has this beautiful question uh, has asked, but on the factory floor, this has been normal. And I think uh, responsible companies, I think, should uh, should continue to give safety uh, a priority for the workforce. Uh, uh, product quality, uh, as an example, uh, you know, something which uh, products which David, um, you know, produces, you know, have to, uh, you know, have to be, uh, you know, really, really safe. And, and 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 really secure, and uh, so both the product and the and the and then the people in the process, you know, have uh, have to be, uh, you know, kept safe. And I think that's a responsibility which most companies, uh, you know, would, uh, you know, would, uh, uh, you know, would adhere to. So David, people talk about cars being taken over by someone, while you or me are sitting and driving the car. What about that? Yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, as you as you were talking about, uh, you know, the issues that arise. I think there's two broad areas um, that, and, and you referred to one of them in in your in your in your speech was, uh, you know, it, what's the uh, what's the risk of the car being being hacked, and how do we respond to that? So, you know, we invest a, a huge amount of time in thinking about the the cyber risks of the car. Um, we you know analyze the you know the uh, you know the attack surfaces that are exposed, whether it's um, you know through uh, you know the the, the kind of uh, over-the-air updates that we have for our firmware for uh, improved uh, driving features, or you know maybe somebody plugs in a, an EV to a charging station and exposes um, you know an avenue for attack there. So there's a the, you know there's a wealth of different uh, opportunities. Um, you know we have to spend a great deal of time uh, ensuring that we um, architect. And, uh, and, uh, and, and secure them. Now, we're fortunate in our company that you know, Vingroup actually has a, an entire company devoted to cybersecurity. So, uh, you know, we're the beneficiary of that. The other area that uh, kind of is exposed, I guess, is in the autonomous driving area. Again, um, whether there's flaws in programming uh, or flaws in machine learning uh, and, and, the, and the learning process that expose um, the, the consumer to safety issues. These are all things that we have to really very, very tightly control and, uh, and, and make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're doing testing to ensure that the customer safety is a priority. I, I can tell you there's no single avenue to ensuring, um, you know, complete 
fail-safe uh, security. So um, that's where I think uh, the companies that will distinguish themselves in these factors and these facets will be the ones that will emerge um, with consumer confidence, trust, and uh, you know, ultimately market share over time. Thank you. So I won't ask Samir this uh, same question to you because luckily in your industry, uh, nobody can be hurt. You know, well, actually, I would not. like to I would like to weigh in on that. There are two fail safes, you know, really important for the media business. One for the business itself is obviously piracy. Um, yes. You know that you know the risk of everything getting pirated in the physical world. It was much reduced. Uh, now in the digital world, from the last thirty years, uh, the ease of piracy has you know sort of it's easier to pirate things, and so it's a big battle, and we continue to fight it. So that's from the business point of view. But actually, from the consumer point of view, um, the really biggest failsafe for the media business is the sort of, you know, the control of fake news, right? Uh, we've seen that happening already. It's, you know, large media companies spread all over the place, touch, you know, a couple of billion lives on an every minute basis and uh, have the ability to, you know, change the narrative in any direction they want to. And that's a really big thing. And it's got to be, it's, it's eventually going to either get regulated or, you know, it's got to be called out because it's a really, really big thing. And, you know, because it's so insidious and because it's so ubiquitous, um, you don't realize what's happening. And uh, it's, it's a big deal. And that's, I think, the biggest fail safe, you know, that where can media go wrong? Here. Yes, yes, yes. So. That's interesting. So Vijay, what if I send money to somebody and instead of that person, you get it? Uh, I'll say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how uh, do you how do you take care of this no this uh look uh banks have mechanisms um you know to reverse transactions um assuming they go to the wrong people but if it's a genuine mistake that is made by you that's a very difficult that is a very di very difficult to sort of differentiate that by you wanting to actually send it so um I think that, you know, look, a lot of the financial institutions have very, very strong failsafe mechanisms. Um, you know, they have several redundancies built, um, you know, not just in sort of the programs and power and all of various things. But the greatest risk is actually a virus. Um, you know, that is something that, um, you know, if it starts spreading through, you know, global systems, that can create untold amounts of havoc. Um, and that's, that's basically what, it's a black swan thing. You just can't protect yourself. You try as much as you can, um, but existing architecture that people have, you know, most of the sort of forefront banks, they heavily, heavily uh, invest in this. So they're comfortable with that. But this, you know, outlier risk is something that they just can't take care of. Thank you. So just one uh, last question to everyone. Uh, kind of taking you outside of your industry. Um, how do you think the digital revolution is likely to affect the world as a whole, the society as a whole? Just kind of 30 seconds each. Josh? You know, I, think, uh, the, I think the digital revolution has uh, maybe two, two aspects I'd like to talk about. I think one is clearly the, the availability of information is now democratic. You know, you may hold a different type of handset, but the content is available. So I think that's that's very powerful. People in small towns, people who do not have the privilege of uh, data content are, are having that. I think that's powerful. In terms of manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure David's factory, uh, you know, em employs a lot of women. I've spent a couple of years in Vietnam. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the electronics manufacturing industry, um, is this incredible uh, opportunity for women coming from uh, different walks of life? And, uh, and I mean, uh, you know, as an example, you know, we we employ uh, you know almost hundred percent women in our uh, in our factory uh, factory floor, and it is it is an opportunity for women to come into the manufacturing space, which was not uh, you know sort of the case uh, before. So those would be my two sort of uh, pointers. Very interesting, David. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Ravi. I guess, uh, you know, we have a fundamentally uh, optimistic view on the impact that uh, technology will have. And we try to express that in, uh, you know, bringing 
these uh, EV cars to mass market uh, population. Um, we don't want them to be exclusive. We, you know, we want to try and have, uh, you know, high technology and clean mobility, you know, for all. And, and that's part of our, our kind of goal and our mission statement. So, uh, you know, in answer to your question, how will uh, uh, an emerging digital economy impact people? Um, I, I and, and BINFAST, I think we have a fundamentally uh, optimistic view that it will be positive, it'll be beneficial, and it will encourage the transformation to a, a clean and fairer society. Thank you. Samir? Um, you know, we are in the business of mass distraction. Uh, that's what we do. Um, so obviously, you know, digital technology is wonderful because it reaches out to billions of people and, you know, gets to them quicker and faster and nicer. Um, so obviously, in that sense, you know, it's a, it's a growth it's a growth thing and it's just you know, really wonderful. But, you know, just not to be bleak about it, but the thing is that the way the, the population in India and globally is that there is a big social inequality in place, right, already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, global hunger and poverty are real things. Um, there was this very famous movie made by Steven Spielberg a few years back called Ready Player One. So at the end of that picture, you know, after this boy has spent his entire time living in this metaverse and playing this game and doing all of that, when he comes out of it and he goes and meets the creator of the game, right? Say Mark Zuckerberg or whoever, who tells him that, you know, it's really wonderful and you had a great time playing the game. You spent your entire life playing this game. But remember, you can never eat real food in the online world, right? To eat real food, you have to get back to the physical world. And then when you come back to the real world, there is real hunger. So I think, um, you know, it's really important for all of this that's happening is to be more inclusive and to take everyone along. Because otherwise, we live in a very distorted, funny place, you know, where, you know, you're talking about large amount of people who have now in India, you've got large amount of people who've got mobile phones, but that doesn't really resolve it. You know, I mean, obviously, it works from an entertainment point of view, you watch a movie and, you know, while away a few hours. But I think, you know, real problems are real problems and they will need addressing. Yeah. yeah, just very quickly, ours is more on financial inclusion, um, you know, costs are coming down, efficiency is increasing, and that's really the most important thing that, you know, the digital revolution in finance can do. So I think it'll benefit a lot of people. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, dear panelists. Um, it was really a very scintillating session. You know, you bringing out different facets of your respective industries and bringing out the impact of that on, uh, on, the, uh, on the economy as a whole and the world as a whole. Uh, it has been a very, very enjoyable session. Thank you very much. And I want to, uh, I would really learnt, like to uh, you know, put on board the appreciation that I have for the time that we are spending for all the audience that, that is there. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone on the panel for your views, comments, and indeed for the many transformative ideas towards building a digital world across diverse sectors. Dear viewers, our next session begins in approximately 45 minutes at 5 p.m. We look forward to your participation then. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.